I think he mentioned, or it's in your bulletins anyways, the Voice of the Martyrs Conference that's coming up February 1st at First Baptist Church of Crystal River. Marlene Sennel has been working with Voice of the Martyrs now for some time, and she's helping to coordinate this conference. And uh, if you're interested in going, I would highly encourage you to go. If you're not interested in going, go and you'll become interested in going. <laughs> because everybody that I know that has gone to one of the Voice of the Martyrs conferences has really appreciated hearing from the speakers, many of whom come from places where they experience persecution. Uh, Pastor Shai will be there from China. He spent three years in prison for his faith. Russell Stendhal, um, a missionary in Colombia, was captured by Marxist guerrillas and spent uh, five or six months in, in uh, uh, a guerrilla captivity. And he'll be there speaking. Darcy Gill will be there, Robert Brock, all, all sorts of people who many of them have experienced firsthand persecution simply for being a Christian and, and trying to follow the Lord uh, in spreading his word in their particular country. So it's always, it's always a blessing to hear from these people. Uh, Marlene is helping to coordinate it. She could use, I, I believe, a few more workers, so I'm going to let her tell you more about that. It's a great morning, isn't it? Isn't it nice to be able to come to church and to sit in either an air-conditioned or a heated church, have beautiful seats to sit in, a beautiful building to enter, to have your pastor up here who can speak on uh, on anything that he wants to about the bible and god's word well for many christians this isn't even possible because many of them have to hide and travel miles just to get to a person who has a bible february 1st is the voice of Mar uh, voice the martyrs is having a regional conference and you will hear amazing testimonies from our brothers and sisters who have traveled in these countries and who are now uh, out telling us about what's going on over there. I'm the area coordinator for the state of Florida and Puerto Rico, and I have 18 area representatives under me. One of them is Ryan, Brian, who was the one that was instrumental in uh, recruiting me to Voice the Martyrs. But anyway, if I don't need any uh, more uh, help, if you approach me, I'll take your name if you want to go. It's nine to five, or it's from nine to five, but workers from 7.30 to five o'clock in the evening. I wanna challenge Grace Bible Church. We are all sitting here very, very comfortable. And you're saying, oh yeah, I'd like to go. But you know, I wanna do shopping on Saturday, or I, you know, I work all week, I don't want to go. Or I'd like to go, but you know, I don't want to hear those sad, sad stories. Let me tell you, we need to hear those stories because what they're going through is going to be happening here and you're going to need to know how to handle it. And they have to be our example. And I want to challenge Grace Bible because I think there's about 15 people right now that are going to volunteer for this. You don't have to volunteer to help, but come out and back your brothers and sisters up. Get on the website, www.meetings.com, sign up, that's all you have to do, and be at First Baptist Church of Crystal River, Saturday, February 1st, and support your, uh, support your brothers and sisters, because they will go back and they will talk about it. And Pastor said Russell Stendhal, uh, Russell Stendhal, he he's the pilot that flies into Columbia. He was arrested. He's got a ministry where he flies into Columbia. He drops parachutes down to the FARC guerrillas, and he now has generals calling him and saying, Russell, fly lower, fly lower. Get us some more of those uh, radios. Get them down here. So it's working. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Uh, Pastor Curry from Israel. He lives in Bethlehem. And he's got a ministry in Israel, as well as his father, who's a pastor. Hear about what's going on in, in Israel today, and he will share that, things that are not on the news. And then we have this pastor, she, I never heard him speak, but I've heard other uh, people that have come from China speak. You will be amazed, okay? I would like you to commit the, the topic of this particular uh, conferences, I commit. Bring your children, have them hear what's going on. 
It's free. There's no charge for it, okay? God bless each and every one. And I thank all of those here that are already, including pastor, supporting Voice the Martyrs. Thank you. And Marlene will be around in, in the front here right after the service. Some, and if you would like to volunteer, you can see her. Um, if you're just interested in going, again, it starts at 9 a.m. on that Saturday. And if we have enough people that want to go but don't have transportation, uh, we'll take the church van. And so you can let me know if you, if you for some reason, can't drive up there or don't want to drive up there and you'd like to ride on the church van, uh, see me and I'll give you a first-hand experience of what it's like to ride with a race car driver in the church van. <laughs> now, <laughs> race car <sighs> Yeah, uh, Marlene mentioned we need to get ready uh, for persecution. I heard a sermon by Erwin Lutzer one time. We were up at Moody at the, one of the pastor's conferences, and he said exactly that. He said, we need to be training this nec next generation, which almost sounds too soon. Uh, to know how to endure persecution because he believes things for this next generation are going to get pretty bad even here in the United States of America. So something, something to think about. But it's still, just even if it doesn't, it's still an encouragement to hear from our brothers and sisters in Christ and see what they've gone through. Well, I, I kind of wonder if God's trying to teach Diane and I something this morning. Uh, at the first service... Uh, I got up here and I had my Voice of the Martyrs flyer right on top, perfectly on top of my notes, sitting up here, and it, it wasn't thick enough that I could distinguish my notes, and I got up here and I got ready to preach, and I couldn't find my sermon notes. And so I'm standing up here and I go, uh, <laughs> I don't have my, my sermon notes with you. And I, I suppose I could have tried to do it from memory, but I thought it would be better if I had them. So I, Aaron, Aaron York, who was in the sound booth, actually went into my office. I said, I think they're on my desk, and he brought me up different sermon notes <laughs> from, that, were, that were on my desk. And, and I thought, well, where in the world are they? But they were right underneath my flyer. And I, I, I eventually discovered that after feeling like a fool for a couple of minutes up here. And now, now the, Diane's up here with the song, and uh, I don't know what happened with the songs, but it, you, you feel really embarrassed when it's you and you're standing in front of everybody and you can't figure out what's going on. In fact, one of the things I wanted to start off with was a little cartoon. Well, let, did I dismiss the kids yet? I did. Okay. Yeah, I was just making sure. <laughs> no, <laughs> there was a cartoon comic strip in one of the papers, and there was this country-style preacher, and he was praying to God, and he said, "Oh Lord, you know I don't ever ask for much, but but Lord, I pray that you would grant me just this one thing: dignity." And then in the next frame, you see this lightning bolt striking the preacher, and this bam. And then the frame after that, you see the preacher standing there and his pants had dropped down around his ankles and he's wearing heart-colored, col heart-embroidered underwear in that frame. And he says, uh, Lord, is this a test? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, God is oftentimes involved in testing us in various ways for a variety of different reasons. And we see that vividly in the life of Abraham. And this morning, I'd like to piggy tail off of last week's sermon where we talked about surrender. You remember when we looked at the book of James where it says, Submit yourselves uh, therefore unto God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And we talked about submission requires unconditional surrender of myself, of my life, of my attachments, of all that I am and all that I have. God wants all of us. And by all of us, I mean he wants 100% of my affection, my loyalty, and my love. Not just 50% or 75% or even, well, I'm doing better than most. I've given him 80%. He wants all of us. And sometimes in order to, to get that, he provides us or causes to come into our life various types of tests. In order to grow in faith, we must at least occasionally and I think probably more often than that, be tested. 
We have to be brought to that point sometimes in our lives where we trust God's word rather than human logic, where we can watch God work and supply and lead and guide. We have to be tested sometimes to keep us aware of our mortality and sometimes our humility. We have to be tested sometimes so we can see where we are spiritually. You know, oftentimes we think we're doing better than we may really be doing as God knows how we're really doing, even better than we know how we're doing. And sometimes He brings tests into our lives to reveal to us areas where we need to grow. We have to be tested sometimes to completely surrender to God, to get to that point in our life where we recognize, okay, I've got a choice to make and I need to give it all to God. Those tests may come in a variety of different forms, many of which are seen in the life, again, of Abraham, including one supreme test that all of you are familiar with, but I'd like to look at it again in Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. Beginning with verse 1, we'll read all the way through 18. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he, carried him, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father? Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by his horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place the Lord will provide, or in the Hebrew, it's Jehovah Jireh. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possessions of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Let's pray. Father in heaven, again, as we look at your word this morning together, corporately, as your body, I pray that you would help us to see the things that you have for us in it this morning. Father, I pray for your leading and continued guidance. I pray for an open heart on my part and on the part of everybody that's here. And Father, I pray that we would uh, do as Abraham did, that we would totally, completely surrender our will to your will. That we would do whatever it is you want of us, whatever you desire of us, whatever uh, you call us to do, wherever you lead, wherever we ought to go that we would say, yes, Lord, and we would follow through with obedience. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be at work in our hearts, causing us to become even more surrendered to you this day. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I read through this passage after a, a discussion we had over the Christmas holidays with my son about the topic of surrender. 
And what it says in verse 12 really jumped out at me. Again, if you look at verse 12, it says, Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God. Now I know. That phrase, now I know, really leaped off the page for some reason to me, and I know what that reason is. It was because I thought, well, gee, what about all the other things Abraham had done? It takes this before God says, now I know that you fear God. Now, granted, this is probably the greatest test that Abraham ever faced. Probably the, the greatest test that any of us could ever face. The, the offering up of your son. And, and, a, and a test, by the way, that, that God doesn't ask of many people in Scripture ever, right? Um, we realize that that's the case because God forbids, actually, later on in the law of Moses, human sacrifice. Although it was a common practice in the land of Canaan among those that worship Molech and other pagan gods and deities of the land of Canaan, where sometimes they would even offer up their infant children, put them in the hands of a, a, a red-hot statue of Molech, and they would literally fry their children alive as a sacrifice to their God. And so Abraham was probably familiar with human sacrifices, but, but God doesn't ask us to sacrifice our children to him. In fact, he forbids it later on. But here he makes this request to Abraham. And, and then after Abraham successfully comes to that point where he is willing to offer his son, God interferes with the, the sacrifice and provides a substitute for Abraham to sacrifice instead. But it takes this much of Abraham's life before we read this statement, now I know that you fear God. And again, I thought about what about all the other times that Abraham obeyed God? Way back in the book of Genesis chapter 11, God caused Abraham to leave his family. At that time, his name is Abram. It later becomes Abraham. His wife's name is Sarai. It later becomes Sarah. And he says, to leave your country, to leave your relatives, leave your family. Now, he takes his father, Tehran, this morning service. I, after I couldn't find my notes, I was so flustered, I couldn't remember who Tehran was. I couldn't remember his name. Uh, sometimes little things like that throw you off. I don't know if you've ever experienced that, and it takes you a while to get back on track. But um, Abraham left Ur of the Chaldeans as God had told him to leave. And he traveled uh, on his way to the promised land, not knowing where the promised land was. God said simply to Abraham, go to a land that I will show you. Now that takes a lot. We read through these passages and we don't think much about the emotions and, and the anguish and, the, and all of the little things that have to be done to accomplish some of these things that God instructed people to do in, in days gone by, these patriarchs of the faith that we read about. But that takes a lot to pack up and leave your country, doesn't it? I mean, we're, we're talking about going into a foreign land. Now, now here, that's a little hard for you. We have to go to Mexico or Canada to end up in a foreign land. Well, or Georgia, I guess. But, um, <laughs> you know, if you were living over in Europe, it, it would be similar where you, you have to go and there's a, maybe a different culture. I, it was interesting on that motorcycle trip that I took on the way back from Belarus to see, um, you know, the differences between Belarus and Germany, marked differences, especially in relationship to prosperity. And then even differences between Germany and Austria, although, the, you know, they, they speak the same language, a little, little different um, accent or pronunciation but the same language and and very closely related in culture but differences and then to get into Italy which is right on the border of Austria and still even even different there and then Switzerland and and in all of these places there are differences and and this is in a day and age when he can't just load up the suburban or go to U-Haul and, and and rent a trailer and pack everything up it's much more difficult to travel it's much more difficult to move everything from one place to another and then to to go to, to move everything to a place you don't even know where you're going. I, mean, I, I often wonder, how did he know which direction to go in? It doesn't tell us that. God must have somehow guided him, but it doesn't tell how God guided him. And yet we don't see God saying to Abraham, after he does this, after he leaves, and we know there's a little momentary delay where he settles down in Haran, and, and there his um, father dies, and then he gets up and leaves from there and goes uh, finally to the land of Canaan. But he doesn't say after he goes to the land of Canaan, now I know that you fear me. 
It's not until this point where we see God saying that. There's another test that Abraham had, one revolving around his nephew. You remember uh, Lot went with him, and that's because Lot was pro may have been a little bit younger, and he's fatherless. His dad had died in Ur of the Chaldeans, and so Abraham takes his nephew. There's debate over whether he should have done that or not, even whether he should have taken ter uh, Terah, his father, his father, with him or not, because it says to leave your, leave your people, etc., etc., and go to the land that I will show you. But nonetheless, uh, he seems to have been concerned about the wel welfare of Lot. He takes Lot with him, and they get to the point where both of them become successful and prosperous, and th their herds are so big that their, their uh, uh, employees, their workers, their, their sheep herders were battling with each other, or fighting with each other, squabbling with each other over the, the land where they were grazing their sheep. It wasn't big enough to sustain both of them. And so Abraham finally gets to the point where he says, well, you, you go to the right or to the left, and I'll go the opposite direction. He's trying to keep peace uh, with his relatives. And he says, so you pick one place, and I'll go to the other place. And of course, Lot looks at the, the plains where the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were. He was attracted to that. He goes there, he eventually ends up living in Sodom. He's captured when there's this battle that um, takes place between the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah and the king of one other city and uh, some other kings. They go to war. In the process, Lot is taken captive. You remember the story. It's relayed uh, back in Genesis 14. And uh, one of the men escapes. They come to Abraham, who they know is the uncle of Lot, and they say, hey, your nephew has been taken captive by these men. And Abraham goes and rescues his nephew. Now, he could have simply said, well, you know what? He chose to live there. Let him suffer the consequences. Right? He made a decision. He went there. Probably should have went there in the first place. And he's getting what he deserves. But instead he goes and he rescues Lot. He risks himself and, and the lives of 318 trained servants that, that he had, which shows the, the degree of prosperity that he had experienced. And he rescues his nephew. But it's not at that point that God says... Now I know that you fear me. So he's had the test of leaving his country and his relatives behind, going to a strange place where he doesn't even know where, it, where it's going to be. He has the test of, of taking care of his nephew and rescuing him from the hands of these foreign armies. Then there's another type of test that comes, which may seem minor in some ways to us, but I think it's much more major than we would admit to. And that's where he meets the king of Salem, the high priest, Melchizedek. Do you remember that? In Genesis chapter 14, verses 17 through 20, it talks about that. And he recognizes Melchizedek to be a high priest of the living God. And he gives to him a tenth of all that he has in recognition of God's blessing and prosperity. And they say, well, what kind of test is that? It's a big test for a lot of people to give 10% of all that they have. But Abraham did it. And yet it's still not at this point where God says, now I know that you fear me. Then another test related to that type of test comes up when the king of Sodom and, Sodom and, <laughs> the king of Sodom and Gomorrah say to Abraham, hey, you can have any of the spoils that you want to have for rescuing us. And Abram says to the king of Sodom, no, I'm not going to take any of it, least you say or someone else may say, I have made Abraham rich. The only thing that he took, he said, was some, some things for his men. But Abraham didn't take anything because he didn't want anybody else to get the credit for the prosperity that he had. Now, what would you do? I, I know what I would probably be thinking. I'd probably be thinking, well, you know, I risked my neck and I took 318 of my men and we had to, you know, go there and fight and, you know, there's a, there's a payment for taking that kind of risk, right? And, and so it's only right that this man offer me something and it's only right that I say, well, not only right, but I, I, certainly it's okay to say, okay, yeah, I'll take this and this and this and this. But no, Abraham thinks about his, the reputation that he might incur as a result of taking money from the king of Sodom and the fact that people might then give the king of Sodom credit for Abraham be, being rich and Abraham doesn't want anybody else to get that credit only God alone and even if it means giving up something or not taking something suffering a little bit although he was fairly wealthy so I don't know how much suffering it would involve but he's still giving up something you know if you've got a boat at home and somebody offers you a second boat okay I can deal with two you know <laughs> 
there's still that struggle to say no to that second boat or that second car or, or that second house. If somebody was to offer you, if you were to place yourself into a situation similar to Abraham, and, and yet Abraham thinks first and foremost about God and what people might say in the process and say, no thanks, thanks but no thanks. I'd say that's successfully passing a test, and yet it's still not at that point where God says, now I know that you fear me. We see another test that comes up. God tells Abraham that he ha- he's going to give him a sign by which his covenant will be established and remembered. Remember what that sign was? It was the, the sign of circumcision. At the age of 99, Abraham was to be circumcised. He, and at that time Ishmael was his only son through Hagar, which was one of those tests that Abraham didn't successfully pass. Abraham wasn't perfect, and the scriptures include, in fact, that's one of the things I think that lends, and I've mentioned this before, to the authenticity of the Bible. We have a religious book promoting holiness and right living that includes within it the failings of men. Now, and I've said before, if I was going to write a book about God and want to pass it off as, as actually being God's book, I, I would have all the patriarchs being perfect, you know, be like these guys. I wouldn't include some of these weaknesses and failings that we see in the lives of so many of these people, but God does. And while Abraham didn't wait for God's promise to be fulfilled through his wife, Sarah, and he goes into his handmaid and has a son by the name of Ishmael, at, uh, he fails that test, yet there's another test given to him, and God says, here, I'm, I want you to circumcise yourself and every male in your household. You say, well, what's the big deal about that? Mm-hmm. <laughs> 99? <laughs> Gee, God, <laughs> can't I just wait till I die and you can start with the next generation? I mean... <laughs> And we're not, we're not talking about where you can go into a walk-in clinic or a hospital or a sanitary setting where there's no, you know, antiseptic and painkillers and, and, you know, something that will help prevent possible infection or pain. We're talking back where they take a knife and without going, you know, that's a test. <laughs> that's a test. And it's a weird kind of test, if you ask me. Uh, 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 circumcision as a sign of the covenant? Why? I, I, and I, you know, theologians have debated that for centuries. Why? Why circumcision? I mean, why not an ear ring or a nose, no, a nose ring or an ear ring? Or, you know, some, and the only thing I can figure out is, is because I don't know of any other culture that that was a distinguishable uh, characteristic of that culture. Now, you can say, well, there is today. All, I mean, a lot of American kids are circumcised in another country. Yeah, today there is. But if, you know, if God would have said, put a, put a ring in your nose, there were all sorts of cultures that had nose rings. We know that from reading through the Old Testament and from studying archaeology. Uh, there are cultures that had ear rings. We see that. And cultures that had marks, you know, tattoos didn't start with the, our century. Uh, they started way back in the Old Testament. There are passages that talk about being tattooed and forbidding that, actually, that being tattooed for the dead. Apparently, that was a part of some of their pagan work. And so c- circumcision is unique, and they would bear it in their flesh for all the days of their life. And every male child that was circumcised would have a constant reminder throughout their lifetime. You know, you can't take it off, <laughs> right? A nose ring you can take out. You can lose it somewhere. I, I lost my garage opener the other day, you know, because it's not permanently a part of my body. I, I, I did something I haven't done since my back injury. It was a beautiful day. I went outside and I saw the sun, and uh, my motorcycle hasn't been ridden in a long time. And I think, ah, is my back good enough to just take it down and get some gas because the gas tank was almost empty? And, you know, empty gas tanks t- tend to rust, so I wanted to fill it up. And I thought, I'm just going to ride to the Hess station and back. And I took my new garage door opener, because now I've got a garage door opener, so I don't have to hurt my back on it. And I, and I put it on my windshield, the windshield of my motorcycle. And it fit pretty tight. I thought it would be okay. And I go get gas at the Hess station, and I turn around, and I go home, and I, go to, I pull in the driveway, and I go to click the garage door opener so I can pull the motorcycle back into the garage, and guess what? It's not there. And I'm a little paranoid about things like that. You can ask my wife. I thought, oh, man, if I lost that in this subdivision, somebody here might find it 
walk through the subdivision clicking the button, my garage door will open and they'll come in and rob us. So we decided to backtrack. We got in the truck and I got Barb to go with me and we backtracked looking for it, couldn't find it. So then I thought, well, let's walk through the subdivision at least and maybe a little ways down. And walked down 52 just as we were about to give up. I looked down the road a little ways and there was the garage door opener. We had done a lot of praying. I said, thank you, Lord. <laughs> and it still works. This still works. But you know, you can lose a garage door opener. You can't lose circumcision. And it may be that God instituted circumcision as a sign of the covenant because it was a constant, lifelong reminder that God had made a covenant with Abraham. Now because we're not Jewish, we sometimes don't associate it. We do it mainly for medical reasons. We don't associate circumcision well, we do as Christians when we learn, you know, about the Bible. But you know what I'm saying? American culture is becoming more and more divorced from the whole beginnings of circumcision. It was a sign of the covenant. And so Abraham follows through with the command of God to circumcise himself and all of his household. Remember, there's 318 trained servants in his household. There's probably more, more servants. The 318 are those men who could fight as a part of defending their, their possessions and their wealth and their prosperity in those days. You know, you didn't just call 911 and say, hey, somebody's trying to steal my stuff. There was no county sheriff. You were the sheriff of your property. You were the only one that could protect your goods. And so they would train some of their servants to fight. So if there's 300, you imagine coming up to 318 guys who know how to fight and say, guess what, boys? You're all going to get circumcised today. Well, the first thing they're going to do is go, what? <laughs> and what do you mean? What's, what's that? And then, then he explains it to them. I can see 318 guys pulling their swords and say, oh yeah? <laughs> and why is this happening to us? Uh, because God told me to do it. But he does it. He does, we miss that. We think he just walked up and said, hey everybody, you're going to be circumcised today. And they go, oh, good. <laughs> can I be first? <laughs> These are grown men. I don't know what he had to go through to convince them that they had to be. So you can say, well, they were his servants. They had to do it. Okay, that, he might have, hey, do this or get out. You know, I don't know. We miss all of that. But I'm certain it was a test of one sort or another. And Abraham follows through with the test, and yet it's still not at that point in time when God looks at him and says, now I know that you fear me. Now I looked at this passage and I thought, wow, all of this, all of this stuff that Abraham had already done. I mean, wasn't the guy devoted enough? Didn't he express his love often enough? Didn't he express his faithfulness enough? Wasn't he obedient enough? Why is it not until this point where God finally says to him, now I know that you fear me. And the only thing I can come up with is because it isn't until this point in Abraham's life where he is faced with the most difficult decision ever. Remember, he's waited. He's waited for 99 years for a son. I mean, some, some of you that have never had children understand what it's like to want to have children and not be able to have children. Some of you who had to wait for a long period of time, you understand what that's like. And when that baby comes along, it's like, wow, it's the most precious thing to you in the world. Now imagine being Jewish in a day and age when having children was a huge thing because your inheritance was passed on through that child. And it, and it added to your sense of, of significance and, and doing all that you're supposed to do as a man. And So finally he has a son and God says, offer your son, your only son. We miss the turmoil and the mental anguish, the emotions that must have been there as Abraham takes this three-day journey. Remember, it says that he, God says, go and offer your son at Moriah on a hill that I'll show to you. And it tells us in the passage that we read that it took three days. What do you think was going through Abraham's mind on that three-day trek to Moriah? I know what would be going through my mind. I'd be having some ambivalence. I'd be thinking to myself, God, you know, you made a promise to me way back in chapter 11, although he wouldn't have said chapter 11. <laughs> you know, you made a promise to me that through my seed all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And I tried to sort of help that out with, uh, 
Hagar, the handmaid, and you corrected me on that, and you said it's going to be through Sarah, and, and now we've got a son through Sarah, and, and she's too old to have another. She was too old to have the first one. It was miraculous. She's too old to have another one, and so uh, how's this going to all work out, God? I mean, that's just the, trying to figure out the logic of this type of request. Say nothing about the emotions that would go along with take, your one and only son who now, is, he's been in the household for a little while because he's old enough to carry the bundle of sticks. So I'm guessing, you know, apparently he walked. I'm, I'm guessing he walked, but he's old enough. It says that he, they loaded, he was the one carrying the sticks. Abraham carried the fire and the knife. So the boy's, what, probably a teenager? He's been living in the household all this time. Abraham sees him as the promised child of God, obviously a miracle. I mean, he's, he's almost 100 years old. His wife's real close to that. They finally have this child. That doesn't happen at that age in life when you've never had children. And now God says, sacrifice him. My guess is Abraham loved Isaac more than anything else he possessed. And God says, sacrifice him. God puts us in a variety of different tests through life to continually bring us to the point where we have surrendered our all to him, even our children. Now remember, God didn't make him go through with the sacrifice. Abraham didn't know what was going to happen. Now, you say, well, wait a second. Hebrews says, and it does in the book of Hebrews, that Abraham did this by faith, believing that God could even bring his son back from the dead. That's true. But does that make it any easier to plunge the knife into the heart of your son? Oh, yeah, God's going to raise him up. <laughs> no, you, you, that's not going to make it any easier to cause that pain because you know it's going to hurt him. You, in the tears and just, I can see the boy laying there on the wood looking at his dad with fear in his eyes because the knife is raised and God doesn't stop him till the knife is raised till apparently he's ready to come down with it and then God says wait Abraham don't touch the boy and provides for him a substitutionary sacrifice the ram that was caught in the thicket God wanted Abraham's all and it's not until Abraham comes to that point where he is willing to give that he loves most and not just willing, but actually in the process of doing it. You know, sometimes we can get to the willing point, but we never get past the willing point. Yes, I'm, I'm willing, Lord. I'm willing. But we don't go through with it. And God wanted to bring Abraham right to the point where he was not only willing, but he was actually going through with it before God stops him. And that's when God finally says to Abraham, Now I know that you fear me. Now, I don't think this was so much, you may be thinking, well, didn't, isn't God omniscient? Pastor, you've been telling us all along, God's omniscient. Didn't he know that before? Yeah, God knew it, but I don't think Abraham did. Abraham hadn't experienced the reality of total surrender yet. This wasn't for God. This was for Abraham. Abraham had to come to that point in his spiritual life where he was willing to give everything, including the promised child, his one, his only son, to God. And it is at that point where God says, now I know that you fear me. You know, sometimes we live our lives for God based on what we've done in the past. And the older we get, the more likely we are to do that. Well, God, you know, I used to be a Sunday school teacher. I've put in many, many years. I used to help out at the church work days, and I, I used to help with kids club, or I used to, and I used to, and I used to, and, and we, we live life based on the past. But what we see in the life of Abraham is that God is continually working with Abraham right up until the day Abraham dies. You can't live life based on just past accomplishments. God wants your life completely surrendered to Him all the days of your life to the moment He takes you home to glory. And so God was at work in Abraham's life bringing him to that place of complete surrender. Now there are two other neat things I think that we see as we look at testings in the Bible in general and and maybe specifically at the life of Abraham. One is something that my, one of my beloved college professors, a man named Dr. Mark G. Cameron, um, 
you know, when I first went to Bible college, I didn't go for all the right reasons. I didn't, I was just drifting through my first semester. I figured I'd study when I want to and one study, and if I failed, I didn't care. I was only planning on going to Bible college for one semester. I had no idea that I, w- I would spend several years going through Bible college and a Christian college and seminary and, and pursuing. I just thought, one semester, that'll be enough. That's all I want, and I'll just pick up what I want to pick up and forget the rest. And so in some classes I paid very little attention, but Dr. Mark G. Cameron had that way of speaking, an older southern gentleman who wrote a book on Bible doctrines and and could quote more scripture than anybody I'd ever met. In fact, I think he could quote his entire book on Bible doctrines in class. I love to listen to this guy in class. And and he always had this phrase that he would repeat to us all the time. He says, you've got to learn this in life. First comes the testing. Then comes the blessing. First comes the testing. Then comes the blessing. Abraham first had to go through this test where he completely, completely surrendered to God. And then it was through his seed that all the nations of the earth were blessed. And oftentimes God brings trials into our life for the purpose of causing spiritual growth and we miss out on his blessings if we don't successfully go through those tests. But if we do, then we oftentimes experience those blessings. Job would be an example of that. God allows some serious tests to come into the life of Job at the request of Satan. We studied that on Wednesday night and it baffles my mind sometimes. But you know, God allows those tests to come into the life of Job and Job apparently is successful in those tests and he goes through all of that and he didn't curse God and all that happened. And at the end of the story, what happens? God blesses him with twice as much as he had before. First comes the testing, then comes the blessing. Sometimes that blessing is simply in the form of spiritual growth. We don't often think of that. We think think of riches and wealth. Okay, I'll try to pass this test so that God will make me wealthy. You know, God's more concerned with your character than your comfort. And so we see things like this in 1 Peter chapter 1. As the Christians that Peter was writing to were going through various types of tests and trials, Peter says this to them. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, what's greater worth than gold? Your faith. We, we esteem gold sometimes greater than faith. God esteems faith greater than gold. Of greater worth than gold, which perishes, even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. In other words, God is saying here through the Apostle Peter, hey, you guys are going through all sorts of trials. In this particular case, if you read the context of first, Peter, it was persecution. And he says, because I'm refining your faith. And your faith is more important than gold or silver or other types of blessings that we might think of. Sometimes the blessing that comes after the testing is spiritual growth. And that is, although we may not always esteem it as such, the greatest of blessings. Sometimes the blessings don't come in this life, they come in the next life. Jesus said, don't build your treasures here on earth where moth and rust do corrupt and corrode and where thieves break in and steal, but build them where? In heaven. And it may be that in this life you will go through trial after trial after trial as God continually refines you for His purposes so that it will result in praise and glory and honor to God as you live as a vibrant living testimony to Jesus Christ in this world and it won't be until you're in the next that you receive the blessings. For some people that may be true. It's different with each person. You remember at the end of... um, uh, Jesus' ministry on earth after he meets with the disciples again in the gospel of John and they're, they're cooking some fish over a campfire and Jesus comes to them and he says to Peter, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me, Peter? And at one point in, in that conversation, if I'm recalling it correctly, um, John says, but, uh, or somebody says, but what about me? And um, he says something to the effect that, um, you know, don't worry about what's going to happen to you or something different may happen to you. I can't remember the exact wording of it but the bottom line is one thing may happen to one follower of Christ and a totally different thing may happen to another follower of Christ and it doesn't matter what happens to him God is concerned with you and what you do with what happens to you whatever trials he's brought into your life he's brought into your life because he knows you best and knows what you need most 
And those trials aren't always easy. They're difficult. We looked at some of Abraham's. I don't know that I've ever gone through trials like Abraham went through. I certainly have never gone through one where God says, give me your son, to the, where, where I have to kill him. Now, I mentioned last week there was that, that trial where my son had meningitis and was in the hospital and my wife had cancer and I, I came to the point where I gave them up to God because I recognized I couldn't do anything for them but it wasn't me the, who was called to kill them. It was the diseases they had that was wrecking havoc in their life. I can't imagine having to, to do what Abraham did even, even though God intervened and stopped him. I can't imagine getting to the point where I have to raise a knife to kill my son. First comes the testing, then when we obey comes the blessing. And thirdly, thirdly, another thing that we see in testing and the trials that come into our life is that they oftentimes serve as a beautiful picture of what God would do through His Son. We see that with the flood where God saves His people through the flood and, and of course God saves us through Jesus Christ. He's the ark, if you will, that saves us from the wrath of God that is to come. We see that here with Abraham as God provides a ram. By the way, you know where Moriah is, right? You know where Mount Moriah is? Calvary. It's Jerusalem. In fact, most people believe, I don't know that we can prove this beyond any doubt, but most people believe it's right there where the Dome of the Rock is. In fact, it's called the Dome of the Rock because the rock inside of the mosque there is supposed to be the rock upon which Abraham laid Isaac to offer him as a sacrifice. God has Abraham thousands of years before his son, 2,000 years before his son comes into the world to become the sacrifice for our sins where he provides for us that substitutionary sacrifice. He has Abraham as a picture of offering his beloved son out of obedience to God and yet God provides a substitute for him. Christ is our substitute. Christ is the ram that was caught in the thicket. The only thing is the ram was caught in the thicket against its will but Christ came willingly and died willingly for our sins so that we could have eternal life. And Abraham and this particular circumstance here of the offering of his son Isaac I believe is a foreshadowing of what God would do. You know, in John chapter 8, verse 56, something very unique is said about Abraham. Jesus said this. He said, Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day, and he saw it and was glad. And the Jews are saying, Abraham lived 2,000 years ago, bud. <laughs> how in the world did you ever see Abraham, and how in the world did Abraham ever see you? Well, either A, through these beautiful pictures that God revealed to Abraham and the details that I think he must have given to him in addition to what we have in Scripture because there's no place in the Old Testament where we see that Abraham understood things about Jesus or what Jesus would accomplish. So God must have given him some more revelation and it may very well have been in relationship to these events and, and this particular circumstance that we've read about this morning. So, this trial serves as a beautiful picture of what God would do through his son. It helps us to remember as after this, Isaac then has children who have children who have children and indeed eventually the Messiah comes from his loins and all the nations of the earth are blessed through the Messiah. And first and foremost, although that's, that may be first and foremost, <laughs> But we also understand that God wants to bring us through trials to the point where we surrender all. Hudson Taylor was one of the first missionaries to China. Hudson Taylor believed that missionaries should go on the mission field without soliciting support. Wow. wow. How do you do that, right? He said, you simply trust God. Hudson Taylor did something that was very unique in his day and age would be very unique in our, you know, now you can't go on the mission field with most mission organizations, even if you have 80% or 85%. I was talking to Jay and Judy the other day. They got to raise $600 while they're back to go back to the Ukraine because Send International requires them to have 100% of their support to get there for a lot of practical reasons. But can you imagine a missionary coming today and saying, hey, I, wanna, I want several of you to join me in going to China as missionaries and we're going to do it without soliciting any support. We are just going to let God provide. Wow, that's what Hudson Taylor did. 
be unique today, it was unique in his day and age. After he got there and served the Lord in China for several years, he, he realized how vast the need was, as we do even today in China, with the millions and millions of people. And Hudson Taylor came back to England because of illness. And while he was there, he believed that God wanted him to take back 24 missionaries with him. Now, can you imagine trying to recruit 24 missionaries to give up all that they had in England to go to China without soliciting support first? How many of you would say that sounds a little bit impossible? <laughs> I mean, if I was to talk to, uh, you know, Marlene's just trying to get people to give up a day. You know, not to give up their homes and their jobs and to move to a foreign country and to serve the Lord. And that can be hard at times. I try to get volunteers for the nursery. Wow. That ain't even close to saying, hey, I need 24 of you to give up everything to go back to China with me. And Hudson Taylor struggled with that. He struggled with the impossibility in his own mind, in his own thinking of being able to do that. But he relays that how one day, in his diary, he writes this. One day while he's in England, he says, For two or three months, intense conflict existed in my mind. I thought I should lose my mind over this, should I really try to get 24 people to go back with me. A friend invited him to the south coast, coast of England to Brighton for a break. And it was there, while walking along the beach, that Taylor's gloom lifted. It was there that Taylor said to himself, he says, the Lord conquered my unbelief and I surrendered myself to God for this service. I told him that all responsibility as to the issues and consequences must rest with him, that as his servant, it was mine to obey and to follow him. And guess what? Hudson Taylor went back to China with 24 missionaries. And hundreds more went to China after Hudson Taylor, inspired by his dedication and his service and his commitment and his willingness to suffer for the cause of Christ. It wasn't easy. Hudson Taylor's wife died at a young age, 33, after having a mental breakdown. Half of his children died in China. Hudson Taylor himself experienced all sorts of health problems, and, and, and including coming to the point where he was just about mentally totally exhausted. But he did it. Because he got to that point where he really believed that God was calling him to do this. And he said, okay, God, if you want this to happen, I'm giving it all to you. And it's up to you, not only to raise up those 24 missionaries, but for what happens to them. He goes back with 24 missionaries. And then the next century to follow, hundreds follow. Many of those die under the communist takeover of China later on. Those that followed Hudson Taylor's example. But what would have happened if he wouldn't have done that? I wonder what China would be like even today. And you say, well, somebody else would have taken his place. That may be true. But he came to that place of surrender. And God, the first comes the testing and then comes the blessing. And God provided the 24 missionaries. Have you come to that point in your life where you have given everything to God? Everything. And it doesn't, it doesn't end with the decision today. God wants us to be totally surrendered to him all the days of our life. Let's pray. Before, before I ask you that question again, maybe there's somebody here today that has never surrendered their, their eternal destiny to God. Maybe they're trying to be good enough or maybe you're trying to work hard enough or, or do something that you think will earn or merit salvation for you. The bottom line is the scriptures teach quite clearly that you can't do anything to save yourselves. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done, Titus says, but it's according to his mercy he saves us. Have you completely, completely given all of your trust over to Jesus Christ for your salvation? If you haven't, you can do that right now. You can do that right where you're seated. If the Holy Spirit is convicting you to do that, follow through. Don't just come to the point where you're willing. Follow through and put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ. You may want to express it to God with a simple prayer like this. Father in heaven, I believe that Jesus Christ, your son, died on the cross for my sins. And right now, the best I know how, I'm putting all of my trust, all of my trust in him and what he did for me on the cross where he died in my place and then rose again. Jesus, be my Savior. Forgive me. Make me your child. 
with all heads bowed and all eyes still closed, this morning if you prayed that prayer and you meant it from the bottom of your heart, I would like to rejoice with you. The Bible tells us the heavens and, that the angels in heaven rejoice over one sinner that repents, or one sinner that makes that decision. And so if you made that decision, would you just wave at me a little bit? Just raise your hand and wave at me a little bit this morning. Okay. Any, anybody else? If you know Christ as your Savior, have you, like Abraham, surrendered everything to God? Father in heaven, the world offers us so many temptations, so many things that, that cause our eyes to lust and cause us to desire for that which may actually interfere with our relationship with you, which may actually hinder us from serving you. That we see things that we think can bring us pleasure and happiness and yet so often they bring the opposite. So Father, I pray that you would help us each and every day of our lives to be totally surrendered to you, to wake up in the morning recognizing that this is the day that you have made and not only are we to rejoice and be glad in it, but that everything that we are and everything that we have ought to be used for your purposes, whatever they may be for each and every one of us. Father, just help us to be surrendered like Abraham. I ask this in Jesus' name, amen.